What's up, everybody? Ron Placone here with some screening news. First of all, we had a wonderful time at the Da Vinci Film Festival in Los Angeles this past weekend. Left at Wall was part of the festival. Some screenings coming up. February 29th, Omaha, Nebraska. March 1st, doing a Zoom virtual screening for Chicago ticket holders. March 18th, there's a free screening in Washington, D.C., March 22nd, I will be in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm doing a stand-up show with Krish Mohan, a screening of Left at Wall, and a Q&A with myself and Krish. Krish is also in the cast. April 14th, a show screening and Q&A in Los Angeles. And June 8th, a show screening and Q&A in Idlewild, California. Tickets and all information at romplacone.com. See you there. Episode 24. Afini. Afini is an activist, organizer, and abolitionist. I followed her stuff online for a while now, and I've interviewed her in different capacities over the years. She's part of a movement of community engagement dominated by people in their 20s that I find pretty admirable and, dare I say, hopeful. You're definitely going to hear some ideas that challenge the norms in this episode. That's part of 1000. Please welcome to the show. Afini. Afini, good to see you. It's been a minute. It's good to see you too. Always excited to be on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. So uh, let's start. Let's kind of start at the beginning. What got you interested in activism? And then also the, the second part of this question, what radicalized you? Okay, so I started the um, movement, like doing organizing activism work in 2020 um, with the George Floyd uprising. So at first, I mean, I felt uh, it's a little embarrassing, but it's true. Like at first I was very much like a peace activist, very much like reform, um, because prior to this, I was a a political science major. So like I was interested in politics, but I was very much like, liberal dim so bernie supporter type you know Mm -hmm. um so starting that starting with the george Floyd uprising doing like the peace activism and all the reform talk that i was doing i spent like two or three weeks every day um getting fucked up by the police and i think that kind of (laughs) changes your thought process about like the police and what they actually do and i feel like that wasn't the moment that radicalized me that was but that was definitely the beginning um And then I joined an organization called Freedom Fighters DC, um, which was a black communist organization, um, very abolitionist, radical. And they did a lot of like political education, reading circles, things like that. And so the more I did like frontline activism, because we protested for 200 and I would say like 213 days or something like that, um, 2020 and early 2021. Um, like every single day and also being in community with people that were like farther to the left than me. Um, I just think over time, I, the more I learned, the more radical I became. Um, and I think also the moment that really snapped for me was in 2020, at the end of 2020, when all of the Proud Boys and all them folks was up here in D.C., we were doing counter protesting. Um, and you know, we got physically assaulted by a large group of them and we got arrested, you know, the, we got arrested, but like one of them did out of the 24, 25. Um, and so I think that was that arrest specifically and that weekend of arrest. Cause I got arrest, arrested again, that same weekend by secret service. Um, I think it really solidified it for me <laughs> that, not only can the police not exist, but then when you think the police cannot can't exist, and it's like, well, then prisons shouldn't exist. Why then you get to capitalism shouldn't exist, and it just kind of just <laughs> went from there. <laughs> so yeah, just really grateful um, for my journey. Um, not necessarily the arresting and the getting fucked up part, but everything else was cool. Well, <laughs> let's let's stay on what what you mentioned January sixth for a bit. So, so you were there, you were counter protesting and in your experience, was it that the police came down harder on the counter protesters than the people who, you know, essentially stormed the Capitol or or what was your experience there? Absolutely. So I think 
I think this is something that we see throughout movement in general, but black and brown Arab protests, like they're always cracked down more, whether it's a counter protest or not. And I do want to clarify that January 6th, I was not outside. Um, okay. I was outside the month before because they had come to D.C. And this is like a part that not, not a lot of people know, but they came to D.C. in November and December prior to oh, okay so this was a different proud boys event this was not okay all right oh, yeah. Um, thank, yeah they was they was getting ready <laughs> okay 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 all right sorry yeah um but yeah um and we got i got charged with assault mind you i didn't hit anybody i didn't put my hands on anyone i got assaulted and this was one of the few times where like because there was times where i was out there allegedly doing things i should not have been doing but this is one of the few times where I absolutely was not assaulting anyone, mostly because like we were outnumbered. So there's only so much fighting you can do in a situation like that, other than just getting your ass beat. Um, so we were, I was on probation for a year after that. Um, and like that shit is still in my record. Um, and you know, some of them folks, some of them folks from January 6th and all that stuff, like, they went to jail, jail. They went to prison. Um, mm-hmm. But those folks that was there, um, November, December, right before January 6th, like leading up to that, when they was, you know, doing their little test runs to the city and pepper spraying cops and all the other shit, they weren't going to jail like that. They were not getting charged like that. Um, and of course, you know, there's always a racial aspect to all of this all the time because we live in a systemically racist country. Um, so, yeah. Well, there, there's footage of cops referring to the Proud Boys as friendlies. I mean, we, we have it documented. We, we have it documented that, that members of those organizations uh, are on the police force. Members of the KKK are on the police force. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's just a huge difference. And, and that's another thing we have, like, good documentation of. When it's a Black Lives Matter uh, protest or, or anything like that, there's a huge difference in the amount of security you see than when it's, you know, like Proud Boys and stuff like that. I mean, I mean, that's just it's just a simple fact. Like you can't not acknowledge it. Um, so it's yeah, I mean, it, it it's kind of frightening, you know, when to witness it. And, and of course, all the all the experience you've had. Um, so what does it mean to be an abolitionist. Like, like I know you, you identify as an abolitionist. How do you explain that to people? Yeah, I think that for me, especially as a black person, like there's a long tradition of like abolitionist thought um, amongst our revolutionary uh, like leaders. Um, so for me, it's really knowing that not only do we need to like dismantle this entire system, whether it's capitalism, whether it is a prison or police system, um, whether it's the patriarchy, like those things need to be dismantled in order for us to build the equitable society that we um, are striving for. Um, I think a lot of the times people are looking for abolitionists to have all of the answers for every single thing that they would do. Um, And there's a lot of research out there that point to like non-carceral mental health response that works, um, non-carceral first response, whether that's domestic disputes, whether it's violence interruption, those things work. Housing first works. Um, So there, that, I feel like that kind of, that conversation with some of those structural things or like the things around poverty and how the car system can be dismantled through dismantling poverty. I think those, those questions have already answered themselves. Um, but I think that when people talk about like complete and total abolition or a completely different society where capitalism doesn't exist, like, I think it seems like the end of the world for them because we've been like conditioned as Americans, as people that live in the West, to think that capitalism is the is the end all be all. It's the it's the only thing that could work, um, and I genuinely don't think that's true. I'm personally also I'm a communist. You know, I think I'm not really big on the borders thing as well. I'm kind of think I'm thinking through the theory of that. So I think when I talk about abolition, um, if I'm talking about abolition through like a black lens. It's definitely abolition of the police and the prison system, abolition of racialized capitalism. And when we're talking about like just a broader and more ideological sense, um, I think that there's the borders need to be dismantled. I think that the there needs to be a multipolar world um, where 
different government systems can't exist and there isn't a war economy that is sustaining, um, you know, the like sustaining the economy um, and sustaining like finance. Um, I don't know. Like I sometimes I think that because abolition is so unimaginable that we think it's impossible, but so many of these things have existed before racialized capitalism. So many things like so many societies and civilizations have existed before, um, you know, 1492 when Christopher Columbus sailed across the ocean blue yeah, and, something, and, and got lost, you know, and got lost. <laughs> you know I mean? um, so I just, I have such like a broader, I have a, a broader understanding now, I think because of the research and the study that I'm doing, the political education that I'm engaged in, the people that I'm in community with, and also just my experience working with formerly incarcerated people, working with the, um, the carceral system in Maryland as well, and knowing that it, it's, it's never going to work. It was never meant to keep anybody safe. No. Um, and hoping that I can distill these ideas in a way that people can understand and, and access and actually want to support. And I think that's one of the biggest things that abolitionists have succeeded in, like as far as like slavery is concerned, 13th Amendment is also what it is, but also failed in because I think a lot of it is so academic. <laughs> like when we're having these conversations, we're having it on such a high level that people can't even start to imagine or think about what a world, what, what the world would look like if things were different, if some of these systems that we're accustomed to did not actually exist. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you a hundred percent. And and I think it's just when it, when it comes to policing, you know, because I, I identify as an abolitionist as well. And, and, and what that means to me, I, I think my definition is very similar to yours. I, I, I just think when you look at the current system, if you really take a step back and unpack it, it is beyond absurd. It, it is just a completely absurd idea to just, just see the job of a police officer, what it actually is, um, the way the whole thing is orchestrated and unfolds, the the lack of screening that goes on. And it just makes no sense for a job like that to exist in its present state like, like like it makes no sense whatsoever unless you just want a bunch of force to uphold um special interests which is what the police are for the police are not to serve and protect they're just to uphold systems of capitalism systems of white supremacy like, like that's literally at the end of the day what the system is meant to do and people who go in it with well intentions they are driven out that's what the system does. Like, that's just like, like, so when people go, oh, well, it's just a few bad apples. I'm like, that's not, that's not even relevant to the conversation because it's a systemic disease and you need to replace it with something different. And people are like, well, how can we make things better? Like, well, how can we make them worse? Like, I, I mean, I, and I've, I've actually written an essay on like what I would do if I was like elected benevolent dictator this is the type of system to uphold law, like law and order that I would use. And a lot of it does incorporate ideas like housing first and, and, and things like that. And, and more just community uh, engagement and community. I, I don't want to even use the word community policing, but, but to an extent, that sort of thing, like the community members are involved, you know, why, you know, if you're driving recklessly, I'm okay with some type of traffic enforcement, but why should it be the same person who responds to a violence disturbance? Like, why would it be the same person? That doesn't make any sense. So, so yeah, I, I, I think that it's one of those things. People can't imagine a new system, but when you take a look at the actual system, it's just like, well, this is horrible. Like, like this is absolutely terrible. Like, why should this exist? <laughs> Exactly. I think, and you know, it's, there's a lot of fear and like sensationalization around crime and we are a fear driven oh, yeah. society. And I think that something that we don't talk about enough is how violent the culture of America is not just like how we treat people outside of our borders, but just 
in general, like the things that we and the the things that we see in our media is uniquely violent. Like we are, we're just ingesting a lot of violent things. I think uh, the Sandy Hook shooting happened and people just widely accepted that it's okay for children to die in schools. And we did not, we really did nothing to, to actually mitigate that. We did nothing to stop that. We're still seeing school shootings now. So I think when you're, when you're surrounded by the level of violence that we are surrounded by in this country, when you're, when you're driven into paranoia, by the media, by the by the poverty conditions that are that exist in our country, I I do see to an extent why people feel like the police are the thing because that's the only thing people have ever known. Well, I know if, I know if a thing happens, call nine one one, and I can rely on the fact that they're going to show up. When we're having these conversations about abolition, people can't because they can't imagine because they can't see it and they can't rely on it. They can't trust it. That's when they recoil. And I think right now as an organizer, something that we are charged with is making it, making these things seem more realistic to people, making them seem more possible to people, um, whether that's through violence disruption groups and that do not work with the police, whether that's through, um, you know, restorative justice practices, because um, there are a lot of really great organizations all around the country, um, like the Freedom Community Center in St. Louis, for example, that take people out of the carceral system, take them out of the criminal legal system and bring them into a community led process of restorative justice and transformation. And those programs work, they work well. And they, these people deal with extremely violent situations that they're coming and, and, and intervening into, but they're building that trust and they're building that community that, and that makes that possible. And that makes them reliable enough to say like, okay, well, Maybe we don't need as many police. Maybe we can call this thing instead. Um, and I feel like right now a lot of a lot of activism and organizing is fucking performative. It's not the real. It's not the real shit that we actually need. It's a lot of it is for the funders. Is for Instagram. Is for is for the content. And the shit that we really need to do is not sexy. It's not. It's not content worthy. <laughs> and I think that that's that's the biggest issue that we're having right now. Um, and the more that we talk about these programs, the more that we implement these programs and show the efficacy of these programs, I think that that's where we can actually start to like kind of break into that community power that we're going to need in order to fight back against against this system. Yeah, no, I, I mean, it, it's it's a tough sell when, when you basically say, hey, this structure, I don't think it should exist this way anymore. But then I don't know. I mean, let me know if you agree with this or not. But but I, I feel like it does get a little easier when you describe what you would like to replace it with. I, I think a lot of people I, I mean, I've seen a lot of people across political ideology that are on board with the idea of housing first. Like like they like like you just kind of describe it and they're like, yeah, that makes sense. Give people housing. Um, yet, you know, we still don't make those choices because in most, I, I think a lot of it comes down to when it comes to local, uh, local organizing and local politics, so much of it is in the hand of the real estate developers because they figured it out a long time ago. If we, if we just stack the city council with our cronies, uh, we're going to get what we want. You know, they figured that out a long time ago. And, and I feel like the left um or community advocates whatever you want to call it we're just now kind of coming around to that at the same level and, and it's a lot slower than i personally would like yeah i mean we coming around you know like <laughs> i you know have worked in maryland now for about a year and a half um before that i was doing mainly dc organizing and now i kind of do both um, and in Prince George's County, we were able to get rent stabilization. Um, mm -hmm. And that was through coalition organizing, tenant organizing, like really deep community building. Um, and we were able to get rent stabilization. We were also able to get um, a pilot program for like UBI um, to support 800 families in Prince George's County. So it is 
I, I think that these things are possible. I hope that I like, I hope that, you know, I definitely agree with you. <laughs> I no, no, no. I mean, and, and I'm, no, absolutely. And, and, and I, I actually, I mean, I'm you're Gen Z, right? You don't mind my asking. I mean, I'm like, I was born in 1997. Okay. So it's like that yeah. weird in between. Is it? Okay. Um, but they, that's what they say. I feel, I personally identify more Gen Z. I just feel like I'm chronically online enough to be Gen Z. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, but well, I, I just think I just think what Gen Z is doing is incredible. Like 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 I, I kinda I feel like in many ways and, and this isn't you know, I'm not one of these people like I overgeneralize generations. I try not to do that. I, I think every generation has had, you know, good and bad, but but I, I feel like Gen Z in particular is really kind of going places that I didn't see. I mean, I'm a millennial that I didn't see you know, throughout as I was growing up, at least not to this level. And it is, it is very inspiring. I mean, I definitely, I think the generation behind us though, they're the ungovernable ones. I don't know if you've been watching them on the internet, but those are the ones that's really going to start the revolution because child, (laughs) they are like, the youth give me so much hope because I don't know. Especially working in a state like Maryland, like you work with a lot of older people. Like I talk to a lot of older voters. We talk to people in senior homes, and stuff like that. And like you can get them on board with some of the more progressive ideas because there are some of those seniors that do that vote and want to like want to be engaged with that will like t- talk about more progressive things. That, like they know that their future, you know, is dwindling, and so they'll legislate for their grandkids or like and things like that. And they'll they'll think about stuff like that. But I think that the biggest disconnect, even between like Gen Z and millennials, I think that millennials are still kind of willing to go along to get along. And I think that Gen Z, it's like a mix of like laziness and also like knowing that this shit isn't right. (laughs) You know, (laughs) like we're also not willing to work as hard as y'all because it seems ridiculous to us personally. And also it's like, We know that there, I think the Bernie Sanders era helped a lot with, there are, there's a wider consciousness around like uh, Medicare for all and housing, housing first, stuff like that. And especially with everything that's online and you have like, even celebrities like Cardi B, for example, who talk about like socialist policies sometimes. Mm -hmm. I think that that's why Gen Z, not only be more politically conscious, but I just, I don't know. I think I know personally for me, I think a lot of this is bullshit, you know, a lot of what? <laughs> like a lot of this, like a lot of society professionalism. Like, I just think it's I think it's bullshit. I really oh, do. It's, uh, yeah. You know? None of it is bullshit. And and I, I think it's just being exposed. Yeah. I mean, I, I think like, like when people are like, oh, well, people don't want to work and this and that. Like, no, no. People are tired of being exploited. We're seeing the infrastructure crumble and. You know, I think that in many ways, the pandemic was just the I mean, it just sort of accelerated the cliff we were heading off and we had an opportunity. I mean, the car was basically stuck in neutral. We had an opportunity to realize, hey, we're heading off a cliff. Maybe we need to rethink a lot of different things and go in a different direction. Um, We chose not to. I, I would say that largely as a society, we failed and failed miserably. And so now it's like we are just we're just going full throttle towards that cliff again. And and I feel like we're just circling the drain. I hope I'm wrong, but but that's just kind of I mean, I I feel like Brie said this on um, either. I think she's either on her podcast or maybe she said on Rising. But like I am starting to get a little more sympathy for the accelerationist argument just because. I think that especially Americans are very hyper individualized. Like the yeah. pandemic was a moment for everybody to sit down and see that like, it's like, especially like things like TikTok, stuff like that. Like people were building community and like entertaining each other. Like it was literally us mm-hmm. <laughs> up- upholding mm-hmm. and entertaining ourselves while even the entertainment industry wasn't really sure what to do during the pandemic. So it was, I think that people had time to sit down and then also you had like the George Floyd uprising as well. Mm -hmm. You had the um, stop Asian hate movement in 2021. Um, So I just, I don't know. I think that people had that small moment of collectivism, Mm 
And I think they had a little taste of it, even all the mutual aid that was happening in 2020, all of the different like food banks and things that you saw pop up, all the different people that were taking medicine to elders, like people were really taking care of each other in the pandemic as well. Um, So I just, I think that it's fucked up to say, but I think that it might take another catastrophe to people to for, to fully realize like, oh no, like we really have to lean away from this because we're going to continue to be in this cycle of disaster and catastrophe and grief until we get off of this ride. Um, and I think, I think Palestine is also really radicalizing for a lot of people. Um, I think, yes, the domestic issues definitely trump it as far as like the socioeconomic issues, the, the inflation, the cost of living in America is definitely always front of mind for so many different people. But I think also seeing our tax dollars actively get spent on something other than that, that is so disastrous right. and disgusting is very radicalizing. Um, and I think that, I mean, I think Trump was going to win regardless Really, if Joe Biden was gonna win. Nominee? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I it, think it's, it's still kind of too early. I, I feel like because because in 2020, I was I was pretty confident Trump was going to win, but but then it's like as events unfolded, it became apparent that the opposite is true, and a, a stale ham sandwich would have beat Donald Trump. And so I, I I think that we could see a similar roller coaster in 2024 so uh, so i'm like refraining from any predictions for a while now because i'm like there's still time anything could happen and by october i might say it's going to be a landslide for whoever the gop nominee is going to be it's probably going to be trump or it could be a landslide for whoever the dem's going to be which it will likely be biden but uh but man i, I am just at this point and, and part of it is also the amount of enthusiasm i have for the White House is, uh, you know, very, very, very low. <laughs> it was never high ever in my adult life, but it's uh, even lower than it ever has been in the past. I mean, don't get me wrong. I definitely think I, the only reason why I think Trump's going to win is just I think Biden is making the same mistakes that Hillary made. I feel like we're watching 2016 mm-hmm. all over again um, because and I, but just in different ways, because, you know, Hillary didn't campaign where like in the Rust Belt. Hillary didn't go to the swing states and try to get those folks votes. She just thought she had it wrapped up. Right. And I think that Joe Biden, especially with this Bidenomics thing, people are actively saying in the polls, hey, this economic system is not working. Like put Palestine to the side. This economic system is not working. Like people, people are making more money than ever. And they're they're struggling more than ever. And they're feeling that. And you're labeling that Bidenomics. Mm hmm. You know, and you didn't. He also now tax season is around. Motherfuckers owe taxes. I'm afraid to file my taxes. I have never owed money in my entire life. It's because I don't make that much money to Mm -hmm. owe anything. But people who make less than me, who are in my circle, they owe money in taxes. So I already know I'm going to owe money in taxes. And I barely have it. I don't have a car right now. Like I can't, I, I can barely afford the things that I need to on a day to day basis, on a month to month basis, as far as rent's concerned. And now I have to worry about when I file my taxes, I'm going to owe the IRS something. I'm not, I know for somebody who's in my socioeconomic situation, I am in a place of privilege compared to people that are making less money or the same amount of money as me that have children that are like, you know, that are dealing with different socioeconomic uh, constraints. Like, I just, I think that. If they don't do something on that, or if he doesn't do something to address that or change the message around that, on top of the Palestine stuff, on top of all the money that's going out the door to Ukraine, that I think is bipartisan at this point, that we're all tired of the war funding. I don't see, I don't really see a path forward for Biden. But you know, no. Trump, he's a he's a he's a wild card. So you never know <laughs> what he's gonna <laughs> what's gonna go on. So I mean he's you might be right here. Card. No, I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm just saying it's too early. Like, 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 like I'm, I mean, I, I could, you might end up totally being right about that. I mean, cause everything you said is, is spot on. I, I just think, you know, we, I mean, Gore Vidal said it a long time ago where the United States of amnesia, 
So and what happens as far as the White House is concerned is, is you know, the system never works because we've known both of us, even though I'm older than you, both of us have known nothing but Reagan in our lifetimes. We have had nothing but Reagan and slightly harsher versions of Reagan. That's all we've known. And so it's never worked. It's never meant to work. And, you know, except for for an elite few. So every four to eight years, people just take a chance on the other Wall Street sponsored person. And, you know, are they going to take a chance on the other guy this time around or has four years not been enough? That I, I think it's too early to say. But, you know, I mean, that that is in the big scheme of things like the the system that we're living in. And and I always, you know, when it comes to when people come at me, you know, especially as a white guy, when people come at you like, well, are you saying that that Trump and Biden are exactly the same? I, I like to quote Jill Stein where I'm just like, OK, I'm not going to say they're exactly the same, but I am going to say they are not different enough. It, and that's really what it's given, you know, and that's really what it's giving. And I think especially when we're talking about Palestine, we're thinking about Palestine. You know, we just had an airman self-emulate in front of the Israeli, Israeli embassy this, for this past yeah. week. And he, and he passed away as of today. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm going to say, yeah, yeah and I'm a veteran as I well. Think, so yeah. thinking about the like when you even sign that contract to sign your body and your life away to this country to to do whatever <laughs> for for their interests it's just we we are in a we are in a moment where i i just i don't think there's really there's no turning back now mm. i i think if even if joe biden is to stay in the white house for some for some reason I don't see him making it the whole four years. I'm going to be real about that. A president Kamala Harris, it's not going to be great because America hates black and America hates women. So definitely hates black women, you know, and also Kamala Harris is a horrible politician on top of that. So it just makes it even worse, you know? So it's just, I, I do not see, I, I don't see this, this being sustainable. I don't see the cost of living with the stagnant wages being sustainable, regardless of who's in the White House. Um, I think people are getting really fed up with that. Um, I but I don't really see a I don't see a world where Joe Biden or a Democrat wins the presidency, especially if they're going to continue to go down the path they're going policy wise, mm -hmm. um, especially if they're not going to actually keep any of the campaign promises that they had, unless Joe Biden cancels all student loan debt with the Higher Education Act tomorrow and puts a signature on that, I don't really, I don't see where the miracle is going to come from. I really don't. Um, and I, like, I would, to say, to round out, like, the accelerationist point, people, if Trump was doing what Biden is doing right now in Gaza, people would be up in arms. Mm. So, it's not to say that I want Trump in office. Absolutely not. I don't want Trump or Biden in office. Um, I just want people to pay attention. Yeah. And, and just to <laughs> just to like put a qualifier out there and, and I'm not saying you were implying this, but but just to be clear, I am not an accelerationist myself in theory. I, I just think that's what's happening. I'm, I'm not I'm not calling for it to happen. I, I don't want it to happen. I, I just think that that is what is happening. And I, I want it to stop. <laughs> um. But yeah, I'm not one of the, because I know some of those people, they're accelerationists and they're like, oh, well, that's what needs to happen. Like, no, I, I don't think that's what needs to happen. Um, I think it's happening and uh, I wish it wasn't. But uh, all right. So there's a few other places I want to go with you and, and mm -hmm. I want to be mindful of your time. So one of the things that I, I think we have in common, and again, I'm going to need you to, to kind of clarify some stuff for me because I don't, I don't want to like misrepresent anything, but um, you kind of walked away deliberately from the YouTube space a, a little bit. Could you, uh, could you unpack that for me? Yeah. I mean, a lot of it had to do with the fact that organizing is time consuming. Mm -hmm. um, and as much as I love to hear myself talk sometimes, I think that I would much rather do movement building work 
So when it came to a point where like, it's either do movement building work or do podcasting because podcasting is time consuming as well. It's an art in and of itself. Having a good podcast um, is like, you do very well at this, like the editing, the booking, like that stuff takes, t- it takes time, takes effort. It does. And, and you know, you it's, and it's a talent. It really is. If you do it well, it's a talent. Um, so, well, you know, your TikTok's incredible, by the way. So, you know, <laughs> just to, just to jump in here, and and, and just so everybody knows, you, you have an incredible TikTok. Thank so. you. I mean, I just but that should just be me just talking shit in my house, you know, like that. So it's not the same level of like intention. Um, so there was that part of it, and it was also the part, you know, like I'm gonna keep it, I'm gonna keep it real, you know, you know, RBN. There's this internal ideological differences. Um, I don't think I've made it a secret that I do not fuck with Jimmy Dore at all. I never have. Um, and I do think that, you know, they do fuck with him and that's, that's their business. You feel me? Um, but I couldn't I, like one thing about me and people can take this how they want to take it. I'm not sacrificing my principles for white feelings ever, <laughs> ever. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it never has never worked out for black people to capitulate to the sensitivities of white people in our movements ever. Um, so I'm not going to start doing it now. And I, not to say that that's exactly what they're doing, but I do think that there, there are times where they are, they will more harshly criticize somebody like Bree than they'll harshly criticize Jimmy. Um, and I don't really, I don't fuck with that. Cause if you're going to be harsh, be harsh across the board. If you're going to be, if you're going to do all that and you're going to be for that, if you're going to be for folks, be like that across the board. Because if I'm a, if I'm a be like that, if I'm gonna be on that type of time with you, that that's, it doesn't matter who you are. If that's where you've got, if that's the point that you've gotten me to, I'm, I'm going to show up like that no matter what. Um, and I just, that was a big issue for me. I'm not so, going to. So lie. some of the reason that you kind of walked away from that space was, was content related. You, you just felt like. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. Content related. And also just like internal, like internal conversations around why the content is the way it is. And I'm, like I said, I'm just not, not doing it. (laughs) Like I'm just not, it's just not how I move. It's not why I started. It's not why I started organizing. It's not, it just doesn't really align with the type of world that I'm trying to build that a world that is intersectional, a world that does like actually center equity um, regardless of identity. And we don't have that right now. (laughs) So Mm. yeah. Um, Couldn't get with it. Could not get with it. I mean, I, I, I just wanted your take on the whole thing because I, I knew it was something that you kind of did deliberately and, you know, I, I, I was just curious as to why. And, 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 and I do also, I think a lot of people sometimes forget there's a huge portion of the left that doesn't listen to any of this stuff. Like, like they don't listen to any podcast. They don't, they don't have an opinion on YouTube beefs cause they don't, they don't care. And, uh, and I kind of, I mean, as weird as this sounds, like whenever I do, you know, like go to, you know, like like organizing, whether it's like a mutual aid thing or whether it's not. I mean, I don't do much in the electoral realm, but but I will do some stuff at like the local and quasi local level. Whenever I do stuff like that and 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 people don't know who I am, it's a little refreshing in a weird way. I I know that sounds weird to say, (laughs) but it's a little refreshing because they're just like, yeah, I don't. I'm here because of I, I genuinely want to see a change. I, I don't care about clicks on a podcast or a YouTube video. And and there's there's something refreshing about that. And for me personally, you know, I mean, you know, I, I used to work on the Jimmy Dore show. I know you know that about me. Um, I quit a couple years ago for a for a large list of reasons. And I kind of planned on walking away from the space entirely. Um but I do a little bit now with Jordan over at Status Quo. And the reason I said yes to Jordan 
is not because I agree with all of his personal political views. We have our differences. Uh, everyone at Status Quo has some differences, but um, but because he breaks stories. And I feel like in the online media space, if you're committed to firsthand journalism, I find that uh, I like that. And if somebody invites me to be part of that, I'm I'm way more likely to say yes. Um, so, so that, that, that's basically it. And I've been, I've been pretty thorough on my kind of assessment on, on the space and, 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 and I, you know, I blame everybody, including myself. Like, I don't, you know, like, like, I don't really single anyone out. Like, like I, like, I kind of think it's like a overarching thing. And, and so, you know, that's just, I, I was curious your take on it. It's just depressing because, you know, I feel like the left media space back in like 2015, 2016, like watching the debate between Chank and Hassan when they did like communism versus capitalism back in like 2016, I think that was. So I've never seen that. Like, but that was something that was so like ideologically, like mind opening for me because I had never even, like you hear about communism in uh, like college and in school. And I was in the AP program in high school as well. So like all of the classes I did around like history were super academic and, you know, American history around communism is propaganda. So yeah, like that was the first time that I'd actually heard like positive arguments about communism and it made sense to me. And Mm -hmm. also like I've watched Hassan really since then, um, everything that he's done, because I feel like that, that growth tracks. And I think especially a lot of Gen Zers that are chronically online, like a lot of us have had the same kind of evolution, whether it was through TYT or like one of the other like left shows that were like boosting AOC and Bernie Sanders in them. Like that was the start of it for me. And yeah. so I think what's so disappointing now is I feel like there was a lot of power back then. And I think that the power wasn't even realized, like how many Mm. folks that y'all were bringing into the movement just by doing what y'all were doing. Um, But, and now it is, it has devolved into just bullshit. And that's so sad for me. It's so sad for me. Um, So I really hope that we can get back onto, back into a posture where it's not all just like toxic foolishness, but that, I mean, that was, that was the issue. I, as an organizer, I think that something I'm learning t- like more and more over time is that relationships, building and humanizing people like is just so important. And to be able to like humanize folks, build relationships, build genuine relationships with them and be able to disagree with people mm-hmm. that you love, that you fuck with and hold them accountable, even when that shit is like genuinely uncomfortable. I think yeah. there's a difference with that. Um, than what is currently going on. And so that's why it's just, it's hard for me. Um, and I just really hope that we can get back to where, to where it was. Because I, I hear you. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Finish your thought. Oh, no, I was just, I was going to just probably just say the same thing, but just saying that folks like me, like people that are younger than me, they need some type of awakening. And spaces yeah. like that that were actually informative. We need that, you know. No, that that's interesting to to hear you say all that. And and yeah, I, I think that. I mean, first of all, it's like the positive impacts that did happen are still very real, and it's still kind of like helped you on your journey. It helped me on my journey. Like, yeah, I have some very strong d- ideological disagreements with what you know, especially something like TYT. Has done. I mean, I mean, when when Jank endorsed Rick Caruso for me, I mean, I I took that really hard, and I was very angry about that. And you know what? I have plenty of friends in my life who I have ideological differences in with, and some of them supported Rick Caruso. The difference is they don't go around telling people they're the home for progressives. Um, so I I was very ups like just very angered by that. But you know the role that network has played in my life. It has helped me, you know, get to where I'm at now and, and what I'm doing now. And and so, you know, it, it's kind of drawing that line of being like, look, th- those changes were all still positive. Those things that happened were all still positive, even if I'm not really on board with where the space is at now as a whole. And, and yeah, I didn't know about that 
debate. I'd ima- I mean, Jank had to be pro-capitalist, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. Absolutely. yeah. I was going to say, the, the guy who's not sure about rent control and is anti-union. And, and yeah, yeah, I'm sure he had to be. <laughs> he had oh, to yeah. Be he was like, guy. and that's, I think that's what really pissed me off about it. It's like, damn, like, you really going hard for inequality. Like, this is crazy. <laughs> Yeah, he, I mean, well, it's so funny. Like in any other country, that entire network would be considered center right at best. Like like in some cases, even right wing, especially if they're talking about policing and and homelessness. Like, but, but, but in the US, it's just like they could actually, we're the hope for progressives. And some people believe it. It's like, wow, I guess, I guess that term has lost its entire meaning. Um, Oh, it absolutely has. It has. I mean, it's been co-opted years ago. And and yeah, I mean, I, I feel like come about 2020, 2021, it just lost all its meaning, which is about I mean, the, the progressive congressional caucus is, is just such a freaking joke. I, I think you have to have progressive car insurance. I think that's the only qualifier to be in the progressive <laughs> congressional hey, you caucus. Sure, you sure don't have to support Medicare for all. You ain't got to no. support Housing, rent control, you ain't got to support shit. You just got got to say, I am a progressive, and you get in. Yeah, yeah, that's really, it's that easy. Uh, All right, so in closing, (laughs) do you have hope? And if so, where do you get it from? I do have a lot of hope. You know, I think, like I said before we got on, like, I had a really rough morning. Um, And I think there's a lot of hope in conflict. There's a lot of hope Hmm. in there's a lot of hope in like the the parts where you think like, oh, like this is just the worst thing ever. There's a lot of hope in that because there is an opportunity for transformation and for for better things on the other side of that. Um, and that's where I get a lot of my hope from now because you know shit is hard. Like watching, like being on the internet right now is hard. Um, and also knowing that a part of being in pro Palestine is being on the internet and sharing what you see. It's hard. Um, So it's just, I think right now, like I'm, I see so much hope in like the community and the movement that like I'm building in my personal life, like, and in my professional life, I do a lot of national conferences and I talk to a lot of like-minded people. I talk to people like you, like stuff like that, like gives me hope because number one, a lot of us are thinking the same shit. Okay. We're all thinking the same shit. A lot of us are on board to put these solutions together. I think at this point, it's really about people getting in the same room and getting on the same page, getting like, we just need to get on the same page because the people are there. The opportunity is here for us to take the reins of what we want society to look like. And we have the talent, we have the will we have like, and we have the love that exists on our side because that's really, that's really what it all boils down to. Like I love humanity. I love to I love us. I love you as a human being. I love myself. Like, and so because of that, I know damn well, we can do better. <laughs> I know damn well, we can do better. And even when we're in the midst of all this conflict, we're in the midst of all of these things that are like that, that are so devastating as something as devastating as multiple genocides happening at the same time. There is so much hope in how much mobilization is happening, how many people are waking up and seeing this for what it is, how many people are really trying to fundamentally understand that not only does your government not care about you, they care about war so much that they're going to watch you starve and they're going to watch you starve and send your money somewhere else. And then they're going to come and ask, they're going to come to your pockets and ask you for more. Like people are starting to really realize that. And I, there's so much hope in that to know that it, that's that's really that moment for me is what brought me here. So if people are having that realization now, we're going to be able to build so many beautiful and sustainable things. Um, so I I'm excited for that. I'm excited to organize these folks. I'm excited to to get these folks, their analysis together. You know what I'm saying? Because that's really what it all boils down to. And to just to get some fucking wins, like because we that's really what we need some wins and we can we can do it. You know, we just got to get just got to get on the same page first. But we we, we going to get there. I believe in us. <laughs> Feeney, I, I appreciate that. And, and I, I get my hope from from people 
doing the the stuff that you're doing so so thank you for doing what you do uh thanks for doing this show i could talk to you all day but i know unfortunately we can't but uh, but thanks so much for doing the show i really appreciate it of course oh and where, where can people go to learn more about you oh yeah so um my twitter page like so my larger one is back but all of my pages are at facts and fire now um the large one is back. I might not use it now. I don't see it. <laughs> I don't know, but it's there. Um, but yeah, follow me at Fox and Fire um, on everything. And thank you so much, Ron. I know I don't think we ever met in person, but you know we friends for real. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it, and yeah, we'll have to rectify that. Let's cross paths in person soon. Absolutely. That was Afini. Be sure to follow her online at Facts and Fire. Music for the 1000 podcast is provided by Andrew Saxon. Be sure to check out his podcast, the Baywatching Podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. I said podcast way too many times in that sentence. If you want to support this show and the sustainability end, go to patreon.com slash Ron Placone. For a give what you can level, you get all kinds of exclusive perks. I'll make you a theme song. You'll get full stand-up sets not available anywhere else. And you get a bonus 1000 podcast between Andrew and myself. And that's all for a give what you can level even a dollar a month goes a long way uh trying to get some more uh folks on the patreon I, I'm, I'm about uh we're at about the 200 mark i'd like to get to the 250 mark so please if you are able you can actually join for free patreon has a, a tier where you can just follow it and you don't have to give anything uh, so by all means start there and if you think ah you know i i can throw a dollar a month at this that's fantastic but uh, yeah, patreon.com slash Romplicone and give us a five star review, would you? This is still a new podcast. Five star reviews really, really help wherever you get your pods. All right, we're almost at another round number. We're almost at 25. We're at 24. What was I doing at age 24? I was in Seattle, Washington. Maybe that'll be a thing. I'll start saying, uh, I'll, I'll start saying what I was doing at a certain age. And then that'll, that'll end kind of quickly. What's going to happen once we're in the numbers where it's like number 100? I, I probably won't make it. I, I don't know what I'll be doing. I likely will not make that. Although, who knows? Never say never. See y'all next week. Hey guys, Ron Placone here. Take your own 1,000 challenge. No, you don't need to interview 1,000 people, although if you want to do that, go for it. Your 1,000 challenge can be whatever you want. Maybe you want to call a friend out of the blue once a week. Maybe you want to read a book every month. Maybe you want to start a different garden every season. I guess that might be dependent on where you live. Look, the point of the challenge is taking on an endeavor that enriches your life in some way, and it can be measured, and then, of course, you do it regularly. That's what 1000 is doing for me and hopefully for you too. The main reason for this podcast and every podcast I've ever done is to build community. So take your own challenge. Then join our Facebook group. It's called 1000 What's Your Challenge? Question mark. That's 1000 What's Your Challenge? Question mark. And post about what your 1000 challenge is and the progress you're making. All I ask is that people be encouraging of each other's challenges. This is personal and vulnerable, so be cool. There's enough negativity on social media. We don't need to add to it. For those of you who aren't on Facebook, hopefully in the future we'll be expanding to places like Discord, Reddit. But for now, we're starting on Facebook. And again, that Facebook group is called 1000 What's Your Challenge. See you there.